Welcome back to How to Tickle Yourself. I'm your host, Duff McDonald, along with my co-host, Matt McButter. This week's guest, David Sachs, is my kind of guy. He's a Canadian writer. What else could you want? More importantly, he's just written my kind of book. David's the author of several books, including The Revenge of Analog, Save the Deli, The Soul of an Entrepreneur, and The Tastemakers. And then in quarantine, he realized what his next book had to be. It's called The Future is Analog, How to Create a More Human World. It's a message every one of us should be listening to. Welcome to the show, David. It's good to see you. It is great to be here. At the present moment, traveling town to town, the mystery of the motion, right here, right now, right here, right now. So, um, my favorite part of your book, which might be a lot of people's favorites, uh, cause you, you said something so point blank, uh, that it made me laugh out loud. Uh, you were talking about how, you know, for years we've been promised a kind of digital utopia where technology or the algorithm is going to allow us to optimize ourselves into a state of permanent satisfaction. And then there we were in quarantine with all the digital tools we wanted, but suddenly we're all craving a return to get out of our houses. And your, your remark is the digital future was finally here and it fucking sucked. Um, <laughs> it struck me that that was sort of the point of departure for your whole book, right? Suddenly you're sitting there going, oh my God, um, we, now, we now know the answer to what we thought was a utopian dream. Can you tell us what sort of what led to that moment? Yeah, uh, you know, like you and everyone else in the world who wasn't in New Zealand um, at that point of March, April 2020, you know, I was sitting inside. I was at my mother in law's country house, you know, where we fled to get a little more space with my kids, launching my last book into a void, um, you know, back to back to back Zooms, emails, calls. FaceTimes, WhatsApps, party with friends, just screens all day um, and just miserable. And, and, you know, obviously there was this emergency with this pandemic and the, the thing that brought us there. Um, but it, it was just this plunge into the abyss of a life that was lived entirely through digital technology. And um, it was terrible. And most people I knew were experiencing the same sort of miserable thing. And, you know, so I, I, I the, the previous book had come out uh, right around then. It was like April 10th or something, 2020. And uh, it was about entrepreneurship. And um, I think you and I had talked about it at one point uh, prior to that. But, um, <clears throat> you know, we, uh, I was getting as many, if not more interview requests from media around the world who wanted to talk about the future of analog, because I'd written this book in 2016, The Revenge of Analog, which looked at why we had seen a resurgence in non-digital technologies like vinyl records or bookstores or film cameras. And they, they wanted to know what the future of this the, those things were now that everything was sort of being done through a screen. But there was this bigger question they all had, which is like, well, what does this say? You know, everybody's saying this is the new normal. What does this say about the future? Is there ever going to be a time when people are ever going to go back to an office or ever go back to a city or ever, um, you know, go see a concert again now that we can do all these things for our screen? This is what people were saying on the news. This is what people who own technology companies were saying that we had shifted. We had accelerated, you know, 30 years into the future thanks to this emergency pandemic and quarantine. And there was no going back. No one was ever going to back to a grocery store to push a cart when they could Instacart or, you know, whatever delivery again. And, and it was this big question. And, and, and at the core of it was this sort of assumption that the future was always going to be digital. And now it's here. And this is it. This is what it was. And I just viscerally reacted against that. I was like, no, my God, like, why, why are we making this assumption? Why are we saying that this is the best future that we have or the only future we have? Um, and as time went on, 
and you know, April gave way to May, gave way to you know, three years of this thing. Um, we really got to sort of kick the tires and road test that digital future and see what parts of it worked for us. A lot of us liked working from home or it gave us people abilities to do different things. Um, uh, you know, some people liked being able to stream dance performances from their living room and other parts of it that fucking sucked. So to put it like nobody wants their kids to go to school on an iPad, right? That's pretty universal. There might be a few people like I can count them on my hand in the world who are sort of like, yep, that's the future. I want a more digital education for my kids. But for the most part, no, it was this sort of rejection of it. So what, what did we learn about the future from that period where we were kind of given a preview of it? Yeah, you had another line where you called that it, uh, the state we were in a luxurious dystopian prison. Yeah, right? it's can, like it's like we had all the want. conveniences, right? Yeah, whatever you want to do, whatever you want to have, you can have it delivered to your door. You can watch it on a screen. It's incredible. Whatever you want, whatever you want, but you can't go outside. <laughs> you can't talk to anyone face to face. And obviously, that was you know there was good medical health life saving reasons for that, um, but also that that software, that technology, I mean, that was the core of it. Like a Peloton after a pandemic, you're still biking alone in your house, looking at a screen. Mm -hmm. Isn't it? It's nice to ha have both in some ways though, right? I mean, I, I love vinyl. I have a vinyl collection back here. Love listening to records, but I also love having, you know, a catalog of 200 million songs on SoundCloud that I can explore. Um, you know, love books. I still mostly read paper books, but if I'm going away for a while, it's nice to have, you know, six books on my Kindle if I don't know what I want to read next rather than bringing six books with me. Um, you know, and, and with the, and with the school thing too, I mean, it's that, that I think was, might've been me read it in reading your book. It seemed like that was really the straw that broke the camel's back. It was, it I was mean, the kid. Everyone's. Was the, yeah. yeah. As but, we prepare for our children to go on strike on Friday. Yes, I know. In, insane. <laughs> yes. But the, the, you know, the other half of that is that, you know, my kids have been homesick a couple of times and they don't have to, you know, just sit around and watch read along or whatever. You Price know, they, is right. As Price I watched is as right. A child. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and watching all those ter <laughs> terrible shows, but they were kind of fun because they were sick shows and you only saw them when you're sick. But yeah, you know, they can not fall behind if they're back, you know, for a couple of weeks or something like that. So I always find there's like a little tension between both, right? It's like you just, you don't want it to add digital to be leading everything and to supplant. Well, and that's it, right? No, it, yeah. It's not a binary thing. You know, a lot of people are saying, you know, already criticizing, literally judging the book by its cover and saying, you know, well, <laughs> you know, what, what do you mean? You want to do away with technology? Look at all the good stuff. It's like, no, oh my God, I like wrote this book on a computer. I did a bunch of, you know, Zoom phone calls. We're having this wonderful conversation and I don't have to you know, fly to New York to see Duff or, you know, this wouldn't have happened otherwise. And that, mm -hmm. that's, that's the advantages of it. I don't think anyone is arguing or very few people are arguing that we do away with digital technology or stop creating new technologies and, and, and thinking ways to have them in the future. But, you know, for the entirety of my life, any discussion about the future, any sort of narrative about it was almost entirely driven by that technology and its needs. Right. And you see this last year with Zuckerberg and his, you know, meta verse sort of fanatical scheme. Right. Mm -hmm. that we're, we're all going to strap screens to our faces and that's the future of everything. And we're going to have these avatars and that's going to open us up to all this sort of connection. Um, and maybe there will be some uses for it. And maybe there will be people who really like that. But the idea that that is a collective future that we should all work toward is this ridiculous thing. We need a balance. And I think what I'm trying to do is sort of reclaim that balance by saying, look, remember what happened when our world got so out of balance that digital was all we had? Did you enjoy that? Was that a positive thing? Did it make you feel better as a human? Did it make you feel tickled? Did it actually bring you like moments of real humanizing joy? Or was it for the most part, you know, a negative experience that as soon as things reopened, you fled from? You know, you, you know, um, you have a really interesting sentence in the book where you talk where you're talking about digital versus analog. And it, it made me think about, you know, one of the reasons that are uh, we seem to have a lot of fighting going on online 
whether it's politics or elsewhere, but politics is obvious, is that, um, you know, people are looking at screens, right? Uh, and, and, and if they were looking at real people, they might not feel that way and so, or act that way. And you, 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 you have this great sentence that says, digital deals in binary absolutes, ones and zeros, but analog conveys a whole spectrum of color and texture and contains waves of conflicting information that somehow harmoniously exists. And my recent and current and emerging understanding of the nature of reality itself is that it can contain all of the conflicting things. Multitudes. And it doesn't break, right? Yeah. And, and I, it ju it's just such a beautiful idea, right? That's why we need analog, so that you can... Analog um, is reality. And, and right? you know, I, I, I think of the intro to your beautiful book, Tickled, which is displayed behind your left side <laughs> of your head it, as, as the screen faces me, and who knows how it distorts it. Um, and you talk about, you know, you're, you know, I got to know you when you were a business journalist, a financial journalist, and I was writing for business publications too. And you were, you know, a guy who understood numbers and, 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 and the way that you kind of move in that book, I see you've had some massive revelation brought on by, I don't know, near death experience or a tremendous amount of psychedelics. Um, <laughs> or both. <laughs> <Either about>. um, <laughs> is, is this idea that like, the world that we live in can be quantified and organized and categorized in a way that makes it so efficient that we're able to live our lives in some sort of state of perfection, like a machine that works at its absolute peak. And when it does, the entire thing works great, right? And that is the promise of digital technology. That is the logic of digital technology. Um, Moore's law, processing power, and so on. And that is the sort of overriding ideology that pervades digital computers, the people who make it, Silicon Valley, the world of finance that sort of goes around it and sort of, let's say, capitalism, let's capitalism if you want to do it, right? And that is an element of certain things. If you're running a factory floor or an airplane or a rocket ship or, a, you know, coordinating train schedules across, I don't know, Europe. Like, yes, you want to maximize the, the numerical efficiency and the quantitativeness in order to make sure that those trains can run fast and not hit each other and not have delays and so forth, right? Um, uh, but how do you do that with love? How do you do that with children and a family? How do you do that with something like education, which is not just, here's the most efficient way to give you facts. You know, it's not just, here is the way to, I'm going to, I'm going to give you the best information about mathematics and you're going to learn mathematics this way. because this is proven to be the most efficient way. It's a human relationship. It takes part in the world because we are humans living in the world. And I think we kind of lost sight of that until the world was taken away from us as humans for a brief period of time. And all we had was this sort of hyper-efficient quantitative way of living and surviving and relating to the world. And most of us realized this is not enough. This is insufficient for my broad needs, which are often conflicting and confusing and contradictory as a human being, because I am, I said this when I did interviews about the, you know, revenge of analog. People are like, we're going to be super efficient and whatever. It's like, we're not Vulcans. We're not Spock. We're Captain Kirk. We're like <laughs> flawed and romantic and prone to do bad spoken word song versions of Elton John songs. Um, you know, that's, that's who we are as humans. That's the beauty. That's the frustration. That's the idiocy of it all. But we're not this logical thing that moves in this straight upward Moore's lying curve. Um, we're the opposite. That's what gives us creativity and beauty and ideas, whether they're in business or art or life or culture. And, and, and I think we've forgotten that we've devalued that, um, sticky, messy analog essence of life. Did I, Matt, did I ever tell you when I, when I was going to start, when I was going to start, uh, when I was writing the precision paradox before, which turned into tickled, I had this plan where one of the chapters was going to be, uh, the quantified duff. And I was mm -hmm. basically going to do like, go all in on quantified self for a month or two. 
Yeah. Um, and see what happened. I even got like an under the desk uh, treadmill. Or you like, went full AJ Jacobs, uh, so, and I was yeah, yeah. at AJ Jacobs' apartment uh, a few weeks ago, and he still has the treadmill, and he still yeah. It. So, but I couldn't actually do it. Like I was gearing up for it, and I was like, "Oh my god, this is so horrifying to try to count my entire life, even if it would be really funny to do as a chapter in a book." It was I couldn't do it. I couldn't bring myself to do it. And it's, you're making the exact same point, right? It's like. What happened where we thought we could count or algorithm our way to happiness? It's just not possible. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, I think what happened, and this is a bigger, let's say the philosophical trajectory of how we got here and how I got to this, you know, because people say nobody says the future is digital, but you know, that that's an exaggeration. I'm like, okay, let's say it's an exaggeration, but I think what happened that made digital the dominant narrative that we frame the future around is over half a century or so from, you know, the introduction of Microsoft and the personal computer and, you know, Apple being fed. I mean, I'm 43 years old. So we're talking like pretty much shortly before, right when I'm born, you had the sudden incredible pre-Cambrian explosion of digital innovation as computers went from being these sort of large standardized mainframey things in college campuses and military bases to the box in our house that I would, you know, play Operation Wolf on. Um, uh, and then, you know, AOL and ACQ, ICQ and all this sort of jazz. And I was there for all of it. Like, I remember the first Nintendo, you know, getting that. And, and the first time I, you know, went online uh, with a babysitter, teenage babysitter, like download things and, you know, getting ethernet cable when i went to university in, in res like oh here's a door with a locked room it's all yours and all the you know all the streaming content you want <laughs> i'm not young man um uh and and you know cell phone like all of it right um and we saw so many things i think in in at least a very visible way transform fundamentally right you know like like there was this tremendous change. And I think we just assumed that that tremendous change would overtake everything. And it became the most important thing economically, socially, the way people date, you know, the way you would, would think or plan about a business, the way you would create culture. But um, we, we forgot and we sort of lost sight that it wasn't everything. And even if we're doing things through a screen, um, that's not the entirety of, of, of that thing. But we got so used to seeing this as the kind of winning narrative in all these areas, right? It's like the financial crisis happened and it was real estate and Wall Street, but look who's doing good. It's the guys in Silicon Valley and, you know, all these people are evil, but look, you know, the, the iPhone is this great sort of thing that we're holding up that we, we really lost sight of the context in which that happened, which was like, it still happened in this world where we're humans and we have needs and, and we can't just do away with those things. Um, and I think, again, the pandemic drove that home, right? It put all of us into the driver's seat to test drive a fully digital future, at least for a few months. And, um, and for the most part, I think people have rejected that, not all of it, you know, some people really enjoy aspects of it, but I think the that narrative, you know, you, you can't say, well, and this is why I think Meta and Zucker's, Zuckerberg's thing is like really falling on deaf ears or deaf, you know, animatronic heads or whatever the hell he's <laughs> pitching, right? <laughs> it's like, what, what, yeah. huh? What is this? Like 3D Sims? What, what, what year are we in? Like what, yeah, what do we just watch the lawnmower man? What's going on? Here? <laughs> It's it, it's almost comical to watch, I think, what's happening over it's there at Meta, thing. too. Yeah. It's because, I mean, Zuckerberg and Facebook, it certainly served a purpose to begin with. And I mean, my, my particularly staying in touch with friends that live overseas. It's amazing yeah. for that, right? That's the yeah. the one side of the, the double-edged Centralized sword Rolodex with yeah. baby pictures. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and and yeah, every year you get to see, you know, the back-to-school pictures of every single person you know. like. It's, you know, it's on, on, on fast forward for 24 hours, but then there's the other side of it, which is the fact that we're all kind of thinking that Mark looking now to Mark Zuckerberg for, okay, now what should we do next? Now, now how do we organize ourselves next with like 
car- freakishly cartoonish avatars in virtual reality. Um, I don't think that's, I don't, I mean, I, I'm actually, I, I kind of, I work in the space. We make avatars. We, we do, we do lots of stuff for VR, but it's, it's entertainment. And there are certain business applications where it makes sense, but yeah. it's not intended to like, like I was saying earlier, it's kind of enhance, not replace. And I, th- I kind of took that as a bit of a, uh, you know, a bit of a, a thesis in, in your latest book. It's, you know, there are times when it will enhance, but when it replaces it, it's, it, it's terrible. You like become the, a robot. The cocktail party, for example, it sounds like Ugh. you had a great cocktail party early on in early on in COVID. Zoom cocktails. I really enjoyed Zoom cocktails. I mean, the Zoom cocktail is that 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 truly was the you know the dumbest thing, and yeah. I think the Zoom conference is kind of a version of that. It's like you showed up, someone invited me to a Zoom cocktail. I showed up with my drink, and no one else had a drink, and I was like, oh, this is a conference call. Yeah, this is a conference <laughs> call by any other name, right? And mm-hmm. what is the point of that? What is the point of a cocktail party? It's like structureless, casual conversation um, for the purpose of, I don't know, romance, friendships, business, human connection. And, yeah. and you know, this as, a, as this is the antithesis of this um, because of its structure, because it's, it's flat and you're in a grid and you have a specific time and you have to stand a certain way. And like, why would I have a drink when I'm staring at a screen? Like it just, again, it's, it's that idea of like, can it augment it? Can it help us? And that's where we like technology. Does it help us? You know, I've no people are like, Oh, you must be Mr. Analog. You know, you, you must like, I'm like, no, I typed this book on Microsoft word, you know? And, and like, I use Google maps to get around. And it's great. Buying, but, buying, buying plane tickets, right? Yeah. That used to I be just the worst bought a thing plane ever. ticket for a ski trip like an yeah. hour ago. And I researched and booked and all the things online. Fabulous, right? There are certain times when I would love a travel agent, but that's you know a specific <laughs> luxury. Um, but you know, it, it's that idea of like, so I'm going on a ski trip in March. My annual ski trip is coming back. And you know, I get ads now on Facebook or whatever social media for like AR ski goggles. It's like you plug in the ski goggles and it tells you your speed and your altitude that you're going down. I'm like, am I a fucking fighter pilot? Like, why would I need this? Yeah. Why would I need this information? Oh, and then you plug a thing into your boot and it tells you the force on your boots. You know how to like, like, look, man, I was a ski instructor for like five years if you can't do it by feel like there's no technology, but I want, you know, the most advanced jacket to keep the wind and snow off my body. And like Mm -hmm. if Patagonia is using like, you know, artificial intelligence to design the next layer of Gore-Tex, great. Have my money, take it. Right. (laughs) I, I am like fanatical about like, I want like the perfect ski and I will go deep into like, the random ski blogs to read reviews from Joey in Colorado who can tell me that the like Dina star M free 99s are like a third gram lighter, but it's going to chat Like that's, <laughs> that's the stuff that helps me. That's but awesome. then when I'm out on the mountain, like I want my phone on silent. I don't want, I don't even want to bring my phone with me. Right. I want that experience to be everything that it is, which is, you know, the thrill of like gravity and cold and nature and fear and adrenaline and, you know, centrifugal force working in my body to help me do this thing or allow me to do this thing, which gives me the greatest pleasure in the world outside of my family. I'm supposed to say that, but. <laughs> but skiing family. Yeah. You know what? It's a good sport because the kids we, get to do d- it. Joey yeah. and I do, uh, like we did some before quarantine, but we do y- y- a lot of yoga at home. Right. Just because it's like for the two of us, we're actually there. So there's two of us there. So we're not alone. And it's like it's a little more convenient. But we we started doing this one um, uh, website or whatever it is. It's called Allo Yoga. The instructors are great. But one of the things they had is he the guy was in Costa Rica for a week and he was kept referring to it as a yoga retreat. And talking about how great it was that we were all in Costa Rica. And it's like, dude, you're the only one in Costa Rica. None of the rest of us are here. So there's this fundamental confusion on the part of digital where they're yeah. like, oh, it's so fun to share this with you. It's like, 
I'm watching you on a screen, man. Like I'm not yeah. in Costa Rica. You're just making me feel cold. I mean, yeah. yoga is interesting. So, and this, and this fits into the world of tickled, which I love, by the way, uh, not to plug your book on your own podcast. I assume everyone who's listening has read it, but if you haven't, it's a hell of a book and it will, it will change the way you think about the world. And, you know, I, prior to the pandemic had started doing a type of yoga just because a studio opened at the end of my street. It's called Kundalini yoga. You may be familiar with it. It's, you know, there was a particular yogi in India and I think he had trained with the Beatles, but it's very like, like New Yorker 1970s cartoon version of yoga. Like people wear all white. It's not hot girl tight pants yoga. It's like old post-menopausal women in like white, like turban yoga. And there's a lot of chanting and mantras. Like you could sit there for like 15 minutes, just chanting a mantra. And it was such a strange thing. I would describe it to my wife. She would thought it was crazy. I would bring friends to it. They would like walk out, but I, I there was something about it. I loved it. It was so visceral. And anyway, you know, the pandemic happened. Couldn't leave me shut down. Um, uh, and, but they're like, oh, join our classes online. And I tried one time and, you know, I was doing, sitting there, I was doing the things I was listening to it, watching it on a screen and like being absent of that room and the people in it and the collective breathing of, and the vibration of other people seeing Kundalini Mata Shakti for 15 minutes in a row while my back is like, oh, how much longer can you hold on? Um, that was missing. And mm -hmm. that more than just the liturgy of it was that kind of collective human effervescent yeah. energy that, that I realized I was missing. It was the same thing when I had like Jewish high holiday services, and, you know, it was like Yom Kippur, you know, five months later. And someone's like, my parents are like, oh, you can just stream the, the synagogue online. I'm like, ah, I, I, this is boring. <laughs> like, I don't, you know, I need to be somewhere. I need to be doing something. And maybe yeah. that's just me, right? Maybe, maybe I am in some sort of minority. Um, maybe we're just, the I freaks. don't think so. I, I mean, it's, it was like the cocktail party and I, I like the structure of your book as well. Cause you sort of go through it's each, you know, of your latest book, it's each day of the week sort of addresses a different aspect of our dig now increasingly digitally mediated lives. I think Monday is work. Uh, Tuesday is school, Wednesday is commerce. I can't remember them all, but it goes through and, and, and all of them have, uh, I, I think an element of that where, you know, the like work, for instance, isn't just sitting in front of your screen, whatever type of work you, you are, you know, you could, I mean, I, I think for anybody, m most types of vocations, you're, you know, there, there's an aspect of that, but there's also things that you miss. And you also made the argument, things that you miss, not only by being in an office and interacting with people and socializing, but even just on your commute, on your way in, there's a certain, you know, stimulation of the brain that happens differently than when you don't leave your house. Yeah. Right. And, and that's not, and that's not saying like, this is great. Everybody should commute, you know, three hours a day. Um, I mean, I think it's, it's this trade-off, but it's, it's this idea that like we are, there are things we're losing. Like we do make a sacrifice when we move things to digital and, and maybe that sacrifice is worth it, you know, but you ha have to take that into account. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, you make a point early on too, where you're like, we got to watch out who, who owns what, right? Am, am I in charge of my technology or is my technology in charge of me? And you quoted the E.M. Forster uh, story, I guess, story or book, The Machine Stops, and said, we created the machine to do our will, but we cannot make it do our will now. And that's, to me, that's one of the dangers is that we get sort of so locked into, um, you know, uh, uh, having to do steps or something that people aren't even paying attention to where they are, what they're doing. They're just counting the steps because they're like the, 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 the technology insists that I do this. Right. Uh, 10,000. So that's yeah, your minimum. It's like a, it's just a perspective. Guilty. Thing. Guilty. <laughs> All right. But shift, shifting gear slightly, you talk about the craft movement in there, in your book, which I equated to, um, you know, I make this point in tickled that, uh, experts deal in data specialists deal in reality and Ooh. with actual doing things. Right. So, 
uh, to me, the craft movement is a specialist movement, right? To uh, the idea that we should all want to try to figure out how to actually do something as opposed to talk about things. For me, kombucha is my current specialty. Um, and the craft movement, you know, it's, it's not new, but it's resurgent. Is that what, is that what you're gathering from your own reporting? Well, it, it was interesting. So that was, that came out of an interview I did with, um, an academic who's based in the Netherlands, but he works for Cambridge. Um, Jochem Krozen is Dutch. So I mispronounced that terribly. Um, but, uh, he wrote a paper with a couple of other colleagues that I read about, I think in the economist, um, and it was, it was framing sort of the future of work along the lines of the craft movement. And what he was saying was that, you know, these advances in digital technology that are going to become so prevalent, especially in large businesses in certain fields, um, it, artificial intelligence being kind of the, the core of them and sort of automation and so forth. You know, there's this threat that it's going to put everybody out of business or out of work or whatever. Like I get asked in interviews, like, are you worried about GP3 too, whatever the hell it's called? It's going to put you out of business as a writer. I was like, I, no. Um, but what he's saying is, look, this is, this is analogous to the rise of the craft movement. And he had re written previously on craft beers. Um, and he's Dutch and he talked about Heineken. He said, you know, when Heineken came around, I don't know however many hundreds of years ago, like it was this marvel. It was this standardized, cleaner, more industrialized process of a thing that had been this sort of hobbyist pursuit, brewing beer. And it took off because it had this sort of palette and it had the economy of scale. And then we got to this inflection point, I don't know, in the past 50 years, whether it was Heineken or whether it was Coors or Molson or, you know, whatever swag beer you like, um, uh, where people are like, surely there must be more than this. And you had these craft brewers in various places, you know, in Europe and here in, in North America and like Quebec and Colorado was sort of the pinnacle of it, um, who then went and made these different beers in a very craft way, in a, in a handmade, non-industrialized, call it analog way if you want to do it. Um, though I'm sure Heineken's just as analog. Uh, uh, and, and made something that was very much done in this sort of human scale. And craft grew and grew and grew and grew. Now, every town with like six people has a craft brewery. I literally did a canoe trip in Northern Ontario this summer and we came out and there was like a grocery store and a craft brewery. That was the entire town. Um, uh, and they all have their regional taste and their, their flavor and their, their vibe and their thing. And people love that. And craft brewing is like the biggest, fastest growing part of the beer market and the alcohol market pretty much worldwide. So this is the way to think about when we think about the future of work, but what, what um, Krozen and, and his, his colleagues are saying is like, we need to think about work in terms of that idea of craft and, and decide what are the parts of work that we can and ought to automate, right? The filing cabinet or the, the sort of, you know, basic tasks that by digitizing them, we actually free up people to be more creative, to use their skills of craft to make better, more interesting products that are going to appeal to us as human, whether it's beer, whether it's food, whether it's art or books or, you know, corporate consulting ideas, whatever that is, um, it's, 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 it's saying where, where is human ingenuity and that human messiness and, and what we were talking about before, Duff, the, the spectrum of skills and experiences and that sort of secret sauce of humanity that ought not be digitized, can't be digitized. It doesn't actually work when we try to, where do we want that? Where do we want to focus our energy on that? And then where can computers kind of pick up the slack and do the boring stuff, like how we deal with airline ticket bookings. Right. Mm -hmm. I exactly. And I think, a, I think a perfect example of that is one you talk about. And I, I mention it at risk of being blackballed from any, uh, coverage there as a writer going forward, but fuck it. Let's just tell the truth. Um, LinkedIn. Um, you said you have a line in there that says, think of the last time you received an email with the subject. I'd like to add you to my professional network on LinkedIn. What did it mean to you? Probably less than nothing. So I have wondered, you know, granted as a freelance writer, this sort of idea of networking is not really as important uh, to us, but 
the the idea that you can replace meeting people of like mind or persuasion that become part of your network with a digital network um you know we're clearly in the minority here because it's one of the biggest social networks going and it is fucking relentless but i it's unclear to it's me it's also the, the best value social is. network like it actually like it's it's you know like people are a little more civil on it it's super boring so you never really spend more than like 10 minutes on it at one time uh, that's like, true just like, that's true how many videos of simon sinek talking do i need to see but you know i i think and and linkedin's a perfect example i think right like it has a utility it's a Rolodex and contact list for people. If you want to find someone in a specific field or, or or something, it's a good point. I have people reach out to me all the time because they read a book or they read an article. They're interested. In maybe I'm going to speak to their company or something, and they contact me on LinkedIn. Um, and you know, the the thing goes from there. I I think again, it's it, but if you see it as a replacement for mm -hmm. yeah. meeting yeah. people and building actual relationships, then you're really missing out. You know, one of the most uh, I guess, I don't know, interesting or joyous or, or fascinating or whatever you want to call it, things that happened to me in recent weeks was I returned to New York City for the first time since February of 2020. And I did it to do what I usually do when I have a book coming out, which is like press the flesh and drum up interest in it from editors and other people who might be able to help me or whatever. And, you know, like all these trips, it was a mixed bag of some people wanted to meet with me, some people didn't, half the people canceled because they got COVID um, in that three-day period. Uh, but like we, it was, Joey, Joey and I were going to come, but, uh, we had to see, we had a concert that night. Yeah. We, we saw um, Aaron, Aaron Lee Taz Jan at Bowery Ballroom. You can look oh, it up. Very cool. Very cool. Oh, this isn't for the, uh, the book launch. That's in another few weeks. Um, so you're still good. So you got to think of another excuse not to come to that. Um, Sorry. <laughs> take it back. That's Charlie Crockett, November 17th. Okay. Yeah. That's me. November 17th. Yeah. Oh, truly Crockett. Okay, good. Yeah. Good for you. Getting out, seeing the world. Um, but it was just, it was so wonderful to be able to sit down with people, for example, Bloomberg Business Week, a publication I've been writing for on and off for a number of years, as as you once did. Um, and and just sit and have lunch with them and talk to these people. And like it wasn't a transactional thing. It wasn't like, here was an idea I have. When you publish it, it was like, do you want to talk about this? Yeah, what do you talk? Oh, this could work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it was again on that human thing. That's networking, but it's really just catching up with people who you're friendly with. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I think, you know, LinkedIn could allow you to do that by contacting, reaching out to people, then saying, hey, next time in town, let's talk. We can go out for a coffee and turn this into like IRL, a real thing. Um, but I think, again, there's this idea that like, oh, well, we can just amass these people into a virtual Rolodex and the, you know, the number of people you have equals your status or whatever. Um, again, getting to that quantified version of it where maybe the deeper connection means something more. Yeah, mm -hmm. totally. Totally. I like that. And, and, and totally agree. Like there's the, the really positive part of it is you have this expanded annotated Rolodex now, or if someone makes an intro used to make an intro here, I'll give you, you know, they call you and they tell you, you know, call this person, here's their number, right? Um, they'd, I've, I've talked to them, they want to hear from you. As opposed to making the introduction on LinkedIn, you can kind of go, you can see their background. Oh, we went to school at the same school or whatever. And like your ability to, to Matt. And you're connected mm -hmm. to somebody in common and your ability yeah. to kind of maybe build that rapport with that new connection is enhanced by the tool. But if you just use the tool, you know, now what you want to do is go out and actually meet the person IRL, have a coffee with them and build that connection as yeah. opposed to just, you know, having a computer mediated relationship with that new connection. Well, and I think this is, this is the, the, the addendum to, you know, what, what you said right out of the book, Duff, which is like, you know, the meaningless one is the someone who's like, will you reach out to me? You know, will you connect with me on LinkedIn? No intro message, no like, hi, David, I read your book or hi, David, I know so-and-so just like just this thing. Mm -hmm. And then nothing like you never hear from them again. And they're just amassing numbers mm -hmm. to reach mm -hmm. some sort of, I don't know, Delta of whatever, right? Steps, 10,000 <laughs> steps. It's the 10,000 steps of corporate <laughs> connections. Yeah. Um, uh, but you know, when someone's like, Hey, you know, I'm reaching out to you as a human being 
here's why I'm reaching out to you. Great. It's there's no difference between me receiving that on LinkedIn and, and in an email or that's it. Yeah. It's a good point. Whatever. And there are people who I've then, you know, met and forged relationships with. Um, and those relationships, once they're like human, that's, you know, that's a much like the worth of that is much more. All right. So this is, um, this book is out today, November 15th. Uh, speaking of in-person stuff. So we, ju- we just mentioned it. I saw the, I saw with a little bit of envy that you've, you've strung together a little bit of a book tour here. What, yes. uh, what, where can people see you if they happen to be in those necks of the woods? Um, is today, November 15th? In Today's the, November in 15th. The digital future that in we haven't recorded future. this <laughs> yeah. three weeks ago, <laughs> yeah. um, two weeks ago. Well, last night I would have spoken at <laughs> East City Bookshop in DC with Cal Newport. Um, tomorrow night I'll be in Philadelphia at a store called Philly Typewriter. And this is actually someone who reached out to me on LinkedIn or one of the other platforms and said, hey, I opened a typewriter repair shop and it was partly inspired by the other book you know, would you want to come wow. speak here? And I was like, I wow. want to think. So we're doing that with another book called a novel, a store called a novel idea, which is the bookstore next door. Um, uh, New York city in two nights at green light bookstore, the venerable green light in Fort green, where I did my last book launch in quotes virtually, but I'll be there in person. And then the Miami book fair on the 20th. And then, um, after Thanksgiving week, I'll be in Toronto all that week. So if there's any Canadian listeners, I'll be speaking at the Rotman business school. I'll be having a book launch at type books, um, at the JCC where I grew up going to swim lessons, of oh, yeah. North York. Uh, and then I'll be in the West coast. So I'll be going to, um, Seattle for town hall, Powell's the legend in Portland. And then there's some LA San Francisco dates that I hope by the time this podcast comes out, we'll be settled and sorted. Um, you can check it all out at whatever the book's website is at Hachette books. If you type in the futures analog, David Zacks, it'll come up. So I should, you'll, someone will provide that link somehow. I don't know. And the, the and internet, then you also, figure it out. And the, and then you also have uh, saxdavid.com is your website, yes, right? Yes, the never updated website of saxdavid.com. Okay, so check the check the Hachette one first. Probably. Uh, and David, thank you for uh, spending time with us today. Good luck with it. Uh, Such so much, a joy. Such a, a joy to message. be here. It's yeah. a great message. Thank you, guys. And uh, hope to see you soon. In the flesh. Cheers. Wow. So yeah, there's David Sachs. He's uh, so, a, a bit of an alter ego. You know, he, yeah. he used to be a Canadian in New York writing about business too. Uh, he made his move for culture um, and sort of bigger thinking earlier than I did. Um, but um, wow. Uh, also, uh, listeners, it's a great book. Check it out. Mm-hmm. We both read it. I never even had a chance to mention to him because, you know, we don't have a ton of time for these things, but that I I had seen him speak at a, um, they used to be called OMDC. It's on creates like a Canadian film and media granting body. He was, I think the keynote or one of the speakers at, at their kind of annual general meeting back in 20, I'm going to say 2016 when he had, uh, the revenge of analog out. And, uh, I think it sort of had some of the kernels of the ideas that, you know, percolated into, into oh, totally. uh, future analog. That's, yeah. That's what he was saying. Like he'd moved on to other books, but people wanted to talk to him about that book. Mm-hmm. Um, the thing I forgot to mention was that he must know my buddy, Rob Levine, who wrote a book called free ride about how digital was ruining, um, a lot of businesses and that there would be a push to return to analog. I bet those guys know each other. Yeah. Um, I really like the whole part about the return to, you know, craft too, which is, which is interesting. It, it's almost like the, you know, the railing against the alienation caused by the industrial revolution, right? Like people being separated, uh, yeah. separated from, you know, from their, from meaningful work. Right. Mm-hmm. And in some cases, you know, some of the, sometimes being separated maybe by, a, by digitally mediated means from the social aspects of work are, you know, is it, there's a, there's an analogy analog. No, totally. Analogy. And yeah. um, <laughs> but my like my kombucha, even though there was no social aspect to, to it, because I make it with Joey, yeah. uh, it was a revelation for me and continues to be a revelation to do something with my hands 
where I'm, we're actually using stuff from the garden and I go in and I interact with it with sense data and stuff. And, um, it, it made me realize that I spent far too much of my life in my head and should be doing yes. more things. Uh, yep. but no, David, uh, really insightful guy. Uh, mm -hmm. really, really good guy. Really nice guy. I've known him for, I don't know, 10 or 15 years now. Uh, oh, cool. and I didn't, I didn't real, I didn't know that you knew him. That's no, uh, we're, that's we're neck and neck. We're neck and neck in books too. I got to get moving. Cause I think yes. this is his fifth. So, um, and he just, he said he's 43. The guy's got almost a decade on me. He's moving <laughs> faster than I was. If we so, spreadsheeted ourselves. So I've got one for you. Digital. You do. Well, digital. Of course, you know, like I think people don't or people might not think of the origin of digital being, you know, counting on your fingers, right? Your digits, your actual digits. Ah, okay. Right? And then the way that digital information is stored is just using two digits generally if it's, you know, binary binary encoded like 0 and 1, just using two digits to store the all the information. Not really digits, in most cases it's, you know, like a m magnetic um, surface or something where it can be either positive or negative or, uh, um, on a CD or something like that. It could be, a um, acetate where it either has a divot or doesn't have a divot, right? Like where the laser kind of burns a hole or not mm -hmm. a hole. And then when you take the sum of all of those little digits together, you can create a, represent a character, take all those characters together. You can represent whatever you want to represent. All right. I'll give you that one. Yeah. It's, uh, All right. it's, uh, on point and, uh, very interesting. Okay. On, on a similar note, uh, I have one for you. He was talking about, um, and you were talking about a lot. You two were very much in agreement about, uh, it's not that we have to, we want one or the other. Uh, mm -hmm. we want the right parts of each. And I was, uh, reading something this week and, uh, it just jumped out at me. Uh, someone spelled, or I guess it, the writer was trying to make us, me understand it, uh, confusion, but he spelled it C O N dash fusion, a con fusion, right? And <laughs> it, go, yeah, it goes it back, already. <laughs> it goes back to 14th century, the act of mingling together two or more things or notions that are properly separate. They've been Con confused. Fused. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. good, right? That's a great one. That's like in, in the perfect spirit yeah. for, of an I got one for you. Love it. Nice one, Duff. All right. So uh, we'll close out here with a little Lori Bindo. Uh, I've got, the, it'll take a bit of a preface though, uh, but it's it's also on point with what David Sachs is talking about. So I, um, w when Lori Bindo talks about evolution, uh, he he doesn't really speak about it in the way that uh, like a Charles Darwin would, you know, saying um, talking about an insect or a fish having like a random mutation that made it, uh, you know, uh, gave it better survivability or advantage or something. Um, Oriobendo's views of evolution are that there's four main forms of the spirit in manifestation, right? There's matter, life, mind, and spirit. And, the, the the his interesting notion is that oh, so not a lot of people would argue with the fact that matter led to life led to mind right like that there's been these w jumps transcendent jumps but one of oribindo's points is that the higher are involved into in the lower so in matter there is life mind and spirit it, they just need to emerge in life there is mind and spirit they just need to emerge so you have an animal right um, it doesn't quite have the, they don't have the mind of a human, but like where it's sort of emerged out of it. So matter leads to life, leads to mind, leads to spirit. But the point is we need to strive upward. We always need to be striving to break the bondage we're in. So his idea of evolution is life and, and the urge of the spirit wants to break out of its shackles and become something greater than itself. Okay. So bringing it back to David Sachs, the problem with an addiction to technology or a problem with an addiction to technology is that it hampers our spiritual development. This is my idea now. We think it's helping us, but is it really? Because it's, it's chaining us to our own creations. 
right? So we created all these things, right? If you are going to transcend yourself, you need to reach higher than a thing that you made that you now kind of belong to, right? So David Sachs has points us, what he does in his book is he points us to experience, which is and a way to transcend our ordinary nature, right? That, that the only way to really do that is to go outside and do stuff. Otherwise, you will get locked in the routine of what you were just talking about, digits, right? Because mm-hmm. ultimately, that's a routine, if an alternating routine, it's a routine because it's only made up of two things. So here's where you bindo. We have to transcend nature to become supernature. But it follows from what I have said that it is by taking advantage of something still imprisoned in nature itself, by following some line which nature is trying to open to us, that we ought to proceed. By yielding to our ordinary nature, we fall away from both nature itself and from God. By transcending nature, we at once satisfy her strongest impulse, fulfill all her possibilities, and rise towards God. The human verse first touches the divine and then becomes the divine. So the takeaway for me there is you have to be reaching beyond what you are, whether it's in in your mind becoming more spiritual or just sort of getting out of your own rut right? In all parts of your life. So if you're not doing that, if you are turning yourself into a routine, it's not going to happen and you're going to bore yourself to death. Hmm. Is there an app for that? There may be. Let's work (laughs) on it. (laughs) Thanks for listening. We'll be back with you next week. Bye-bye. present moment traveling town to town the mystery of the motion right here right now right here right now whoa right here right now You've been listening to How to Tickle Yourself with your hosts, Duff McDonald and Matt McButter. You can help us by liking, subscribing, and sharing this podcast with others. You can talk to us and see what else is happening on Instagram and Facebook at How to Tickle Yourself. This program was recorded in Studio B of the historic Rockledge Recording Studio and the Tunnel Under Arundel. Right here, right now, our original 16-part theme music was written and recorded by the legendary Paul Reddick and Kyle Ferguson of the Sidemen with the brilliant Steve Mariner on bass and drums and in the mixing room. The podcast is produced and distributed by Storic Media. Our editor is Andrew Steiner. Our coordinator is Samantha Abramovitz. Our producers are Kristen Verbitsky and Chuck LaBella. For more information, visit storicmedia.com. That's S-T-O-R-I-C media.com. My love, my dear.